Okay, thank you very much, Gail. I just want to say, is everybody happy that we record this session? Yes. yes. Okay. And also, uh, we will be taking questions via your camera and via your sound, your, your mic. So if you want to ask a question, just put up your hand. I'd like to introduce, first of all, Karen. And as I've said, we have an ESCOM problem. In fact, at 25 past uh, in Benoni, the ESCOM told us that they were going to have a, a power cut. So I rushed my husband through from Benoni and we just arrived here a few minutes ago. So we'd like to th say thank you to him for his navigation skills. And Karen is in Modifantine without power, so she's going to be on her cell phone. Karen, if you'd like to say hello. Good afternoon, everybody, and I hope that you can hear me quite clearly. Beside the technical difficulties, we will do as much as we can. Karen Denton is our Head of Advocacy and Patient Education, and she comes with many years' experience in teaching, lecturing, uh, particularly in diabetic retinopathy, but for the last few years or so on AMD. I'm Claudette Medifant, and I'm the Head of a Science and Patient Services for Retina South Africa. And my speciality is more about inherited retinal de degeneration. And I'd like to say thank you to Gail and her team for this tremendous initiative. And the only thing we're going to ask you ladies is please to get in touch with all the other occupational health nursing associations so we can duplicate what we hope is going to be a really fruitful session this afternoon. We want to talk today about awareness prevention and rehabilitation. So we need to start off by acknowledging uh, that Corin's pr project is made possible by an unconditional educational grant from Bayer South Africa. And of course, the National Lotteries Commission does give a, a grant to Apple Elizabeth office. And uh, so keep on buying your lotto tickets. It is not all in vain. We've got a, quite a small team. Our patient support team is Karen, as I said, me, uh, Gail, who heads up the Port Elizabeth office, uh, Yonella, who's the social worker with Gail and PE, James Cape, our chairman, Anton von Rouen from PE is our boss, Jean, our treasurer, Linda, Alta von Ameva, as you and she's there this afternoon, with communications in PE, and our two new social workers, relatively new, Lindiwe and Victoria, in Joburg, and we've got other people in our team. Uh, I'm sure you all did a lot of work when you were training, which might, for some of you might be a while ago, about how vision works. And we're just going to do a quick recap. Of course, just say, you know, from the left-hand side of the screen, the light enters the R from the left-hand side. And of course, it goes through the cornea, which not only protects the R, but also starts to focus the light, the photons of light that come in, then go through the pupil. And, you know, the lens is further focusing the light. And we know that when the lens uh, develops opacity, that is called a cataract. The rays of light then go through the vitreous and are focused, hopefully, clearly on the macula, which uh, lines the back of the eye and, of course, converts the light signals to uh, electrical impulses. And this is just to show you a very clever artist impression of what the retina looks like. You've got the light coming in here. You've got the, uh, all the neural layers, then the photoreceptors, which we're going to talk a lot about today. And then the pigment epithelium, which is a very important nurse layer. And nurse, as you as nurses will know what nurses do when you start off. You bring uh, nutrients to the patient and you also take away all the waste. And that's exactly what the pigment epithelium does in the retina. It's a nurse layer. And also then you get this, the, um, the choroid and the chorea capillaris. And this is just an artist impression of what the retina looks like. So the retina is the light is coming in from the vitreous and it goes through that neural layer and comes into contact with the photoreceptors. And the photoreceptors, actually, there are two kinds of photoreceptors, which actually gives a, give us two different kinds of vision. The uh, colored ones that you see in red, green, and blue are actually the cone photoreceptors. 
that are more uh, concentrated in the center or the macula of the retina. And they give us fine focus vision and color vision. And as you move away from the center, you have more rods, which give you a dark vision and peripheral vision. And then what happens when the, the light, the photon of light reacts with either the rods and the cones or both of them, that light the photon is converted into a neural signal, which comes back from the photoreceptors to the neural layer. And the neural message is send, sent via the axons or the tails of the ganglion cell, which are long and joined together to form the optic nerve. And of course that message is then interpreted by the visual cortex and various area, other areas of the brain to give you vision. So uh, this is just a car in the slide, I must tell you, and it it's just shows you actually how vision works. So we have got a picture, Karin's favorite penguin photo, and this, these photons of light are actually entering the eye. And here they start their journey from the retina along the optic nerve and eventually reaching the brain. And there you see the picture reproduced in the brain. And of course, your brain actually relies on memory as well to actually tell you that's a penguin and not an ostrich. But what happens if some of that picture is missing? You actually get missing bits of the picture uh, being interpreted by, by the brain. Talking about you girls now, uh, I think that's important for us to understand what exactly you do. And I heard somebody say they're safety. And we know in big companies, you would work very closely with safety and protection people, either in the factory to make sure that all the necessary protection is there and the environment is safe. And then in the office, you're going to also learn about how you can help pe protect people in the office against blue light damage to the eyes. But I know a large section of your work is all about prevention. For example, airborne infections, you will work with the safety people to make sure that the filters in the uh, air conditioners are changed regularly to make sure that there are no accidents that can actually harm vision. And then we're going to talk a lot about diabetes, or at least Karen is. And then also you're going to talk about rehabilitation. And we all know that the Employment Equity Act allows us or insists that companies give reasonable accommodation to anybody with a problem, any disability, including a visual disability. And that reasonable accommodation, of course, can be uh, as long as a piece of string. And also that I know you, you really need to network with specialist agencies because none of us can be all things to all men. So um, in, in safety and protection, we know it's very often occupation specific. Obviously, somebody who, who drives a forklift has not got the same safety and protection needs as people who are sitting in the stores dispensing whatever it is you make in your, com in your company. We know that people who work outdoors perhaps might need uh, ultraviolet light protection. And we're going to talk about that blue light from screens later on. You know, you need to look at things like safety on walkways, strip marking on steps, uh, that there must be good lighting and good housekeeping and uh, the aisles must be clear. Okay, so let's then look at common forms of vision loss. Refractive errors, that means where there is a refractive error that the light is not being focused onto the retina properly and those can be corrected with spectacles or with contact lenses. An annual optometric checkup might and I think I'm sure a lot of you do, you know, you, if you get hold of your local optometrists and Gail will tell you who, they will actually come and do annual optometric checkups for free for your staff, which is great because you'll pick up any refractive errors. We have a silent disease called glaucoma where often the pressure increases uh, in the vitreous and it's a silent disease. You don't know that the pressure is increasing if you're not seeing an optometrist or an ophthalmologist regularly. And by the time you realize that you've got vision loss, that pressure is very often very difficult to, to treat. And again, somebody who comes as an optom optometrist to do annual checkups at your company will pick up any increase in glaucoma. And then we're gonna talk about retinal diseases. 
peripheral vision loss, which is retinitis pigmentosa, or central vision loss, which is Stargardt's disease. We're also going to talk about diabetic vision loss, age-related macular degeneration, and infections and injuries you know. I don't have to tell you. Immediately you see an injury, you have to have a referral to an ophthalmologist. So let me talk to you about retinitis pigmentosa or peripheral vision loss. These are genetic diseases. And you all know that everybody knows with COVID now about RNA and DNA, and I don't have to explain that to you. I'm sure you know that we inherit half our genetic information from our parents and from our father and our mother, identical copies of the genes, some with a mistake and some without a mutation. And then we also can inherit only a, a good copy of the gene and maybe we're not affected and we only carriers. Uh, Gail will explain that to you in greater detail if you need to afterwards, but we can inherit these genetic mutations from our parents. And if we inherit genes that cause a loss in those rods, remember those little black globules that I showed you, then you will have peripheral vision loss, which is rod loss. And the symptoms of that are poor contrast vision, night vision problems, delayed light to dark adaptation, and field loss. And all of those, I'm sure you're saying, yeah, that, that could be a problem in, in our factory, where we have pools of light, or we have people who have to come to, to work in the dark, and all perhaps they go from the bright sunlight into a darker fat part of the factory. And they might have that delayed light to dark adaptation make, might make it very dangerous. So these are just things for you to be aware of. And of course, the field loss increases the older the person gets. And rods produce something called cone viability factor, which actually protects the cones. Remember, we said the cones with the red, green, and blue, which give you central vision loss, central vision, and also color vision. But if you get to a, a critical threshold where you don't have enough rods producing this cone viability, your rods can be actually affected in later life. And retinitis pigmentosa accompanied by hearing loss, we call Usher's syndrome. And we won't go into that because it's very complicated. The early signs, and these are something that you might detect in your work, is clumsiness. Perhaps someone who, whenever he walks up and down the steps bumps into people, or he seems to trip, or she seems to trip over things that are left in the aisles. People perhaps who avoid dark areas, or who don't like to do a night shift. And they have that slow adaptation where when they come in from a break in the sunlight, they really don't cope very well, particularly in, in slightly darkened areas. Then we come to cone vision loss, which is central vision loss. And remember, we said that is your fine focus area. So if you've got cone loss, your visual acuity is affected. And that means reading, writing, and face recognition are affected quite early on. And you can see from the picture, that's how someone who's got cone vision loss sees they miss the details. Uh, there's a juvenile onset with very variable onset age. And then we've got Stargardt's disease, which is the most common form of a juvenile onset. And I must tell you, I hope you're all sitting down because you know of these conditions in South Africa, one in five, not only star guards, but any genetic retinal condition, one in five in the population are carriers. So I don't know how many people we've got tuned in, Gail might be able to tell us. And if we've got 10 of you, then at least two of you are probably carriers of a single copy of a gene mutation, and that's quite frightening. Uh, Stargardt's disease can also sometimes be called cone and cone rod dystrophy, and it's quite difficult to differentiate. And the early signs are people can't see work at a normal reading distance. They put the work closer and closer and closer in an effort to try and read. So they have poor recognition of detail, and they sometimes move their head to, a lot to try and focus. So that is what we call cone vision loss. And then I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Karen. Are you there, Karen? Great. Everybody hear me okay? Everybody can hear you, Karen. Yeah, great. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about age-related macular degeneration. 
And although it's called age-related, we know that it's occurring at a younger and younger age. And in a recent study in the States, they actually found that a significant number of people who were 40 years old, and many of us are 40 or nearly 40, and had significant age-related macular degeneration already in place. And unfortunately, people are not aware of it very often until it is too late. And one of the things that happens here is that you inherit a gene that causes the protein to go a little bit awry, and then the cells in the retina start to die off. And when they die off, you cannot see through that area. Now, as I said, in the beginning, you're not aware of this because the little areas are small. They're not really detectable, certainly by yourself. But if you go to a really good ophthalmologist or even a superb optometrist, optometrist, they will be able to pick this up. And I know that at the Low Vision Centre in Johannesburg, they're able to actually scan for this and find if you have these little spots of dead tissue occurring. They are called drooves and they normally appear as little yellow spots. And the retina that is affected looks like the picture on the right. You get all these little dead areas all over the place. And unfortunately, it's only when they start to clump together that you realize something is wrong because you don't realize those little pinhole spots here and there. Now, the commonest cause of macular degeneration is the early form, which is dry AMD that affects about 80 to 90 percent of people. It is, as we said, an earlier stage and possibly due to aging or thinning of the macula due to, together with the problem of the inherited gene. We diagnose it the moment drusen appear in the macula. And this is why it is very important for me in their 40s to get a regular check with a good optometrist or an ophthalmologist because the vision loss is very, very gradual. And they often don't realize that people often say, oh, my eyes are just getting a bit old. And it can sometimes deteriorate more swiftly, but the commonest pattern is very, very slow. Diagnosis of macular degeneration starts with the healthcare professional taking a full medical history, both personal and family history. This is followed usually by an ophthalmoscopy to discover any obvious ophthalmic defects. Visual acuity is then assessed using for example, a Snellen chart or similar. Long or short-sightedness can be corrected using spectacles. A dilated eye exam allows the eye care professional to examine the retina in some detail where they can detect macular degeneration many, many, many years before the person is aware that this problem is developing. The signs and symptoms only occur when the macular degeneration is well established and the damage is being done. An AMSLA grid is a wonderful aid to both diagnose and to watch the progression of macular disease. With one eye closed, stare at the dark circle in the centre of the grid. All the surrounding lines should be equal, dark, parallel, with no gaps, no waves. They should be absolutely straight. Then repeat with the other eye. Any change whatsoever should be reported to the eye care professional immediately. Some optometrists, and virtually all ophthalmologists in fact, have the ability to take a fundus photograph in their rooms these days. And we know that today the sophisticated equipment gives an amazing amount of information. OCT and fluorescein angiography give very detailed information about the health and status of the different areas of the retina.
And then last but not least, just to stress once again that using an AMSLA grid is of paramount importance and the grid line should be straight, equal, equally dark, totally parallel and any waviness, any dark blotches, any missing gaps should be reported immediately to an eye care professional. As we're talking about macular degeneration, let's have a quick look at the current up-to-date treatment of wet AMD. It is essential for everyone to know that wet AMD is treated with regular injections of anti-VEGF. Now, the aim of this is to inhibit neovascularization, those tiny blood vessels that form in the retina in an attempt to bring extra oxygen and nutrients to the retina, especially to areas that have been damaged. You will find that this happens in many places in the body, for example, the heart, etc. But when neovascularization forms in the eye, it's a very bad idea because those little blood vessels are fragile, they're weak, they rupture easily, they leak, they cause damage. They are as bad as the South African road surfaces these days with lots of potholes and they cause major damage. And the way to get rid of them is the injection of regular anti-VEGF into the eye. Now, at the moment, there are three registered products available on the market and one that is off-label. There's another important fact to know here. These different products essentially react differently with different people. In other words, some people react to one, some to the other, and some to a third product. So if one of your patients receives anti-VEGF injections and has no response after three months, it is advisable for them to change to one of the other products. There are choices. And interesting, interestingly, a lot of the hesitation that we have from people about switching to one of the other products is the expense. But the cheapest product needs to be injected every single month. Whereas with the other products, we have what we call a treat and extend regime, where they only sometimes need three, sometimes four injections a year. So the ultimate cost really evens out. And obviously, in this day of the pandemic, where people need to visit the ophthalmologist only three or four times a year rather than 12 times a year, this is a major advantage as well. And then one final warning about the off-label product. It is actually contraindicated in people with a cardiovascular problem. I'm going to say a quick word about diabetes and diabetic vision loss in our country. Now, we know that nearly 13% of our South African population has diabetes. And not only that, 20% of these already have diabetic retinopathy, damage to the eye from the diabetes, when they are diagnosed for the first time. And the reason for this is diabetes even before the blood sugar goes up, years before the blood sugar goes up. This is what the diabetes is doing to every single blood vessel in your body. Your blood vessels are being damaged, they're being blocked, they cannot carry oxygen and nutrients to the cells that they need to feed, and they cannot remove the waste products. And the end result for those organs and, for example, the retina, which relies on tiny blood vessels to feed it, can be a disaster. And it's not surprising, then, that diabetes is the leading cause of new blindness in the world today. And this is linked to simply lifestyle. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of lifestyle. 
style. If we don't get off our bottoms and start moving and start eating correctly, we are going to have a problem. And the way for you to, to determine if you or if your patient is getting this horrible disease and if this disaster is happening inside their body before you're aware of it, is simply to measure their waist and their hips. And if their waist is larger than their hips, we know that their blood vessels are taking a massive strain and their end organs are going to be damaged. And we know that, oh, by the way, you measure over the hips where the greater trochanter joins the, um, the pelvis and the narrowest part of the waist. Now, the characteristics of the people we're looking at, as we've just said, the person could be thin, but if their tummy is bigger than their waist, be careful. They also have a cholesterol problem. They have hypertension. They have all the problems that go with hypertension. They have blood that clots for no reason. And you can also look for your patients for acid versus negrican. That is a brownish discoloration found in the axilla or in the neck. They have sleep apnea and a salt intolerance. And please notice that here I have said nothing, nothing at all about blood glucose because it will take another 20, 25 years for the blood glucose to go up. But in the meantime, the person is going to be in a situation of catastrophe. And we need to intervene timelessly. The moment you see that tummy getting a little bit bigger, otherwise we're going to have amputation, sensory loss, blindness, um, retinopathy, cataracts, myocardial infarct, strokes. All of these things can and will present before the blood sugar goes up. So don't think that a diagnosis of diabetes only comes when the blood sugar goes up. It comes 20 so years before because you are sitting on a ticking time bomb with these people and their choice is a healthy lifestyle and everybody knows what that is. Not too much brown and white food, lots of um, green leafy vegetables, lots of color in the diet and just exercise. And you can even exercise sitting in a chair. Just, um, you can wave your arm, and Claudette's very good at talking about this. You can wave your arm in the air if you don't want to wave your legs, for example. Make huge circles for about 40 seconds forward, 40 seconds backwards, and then 40 seconds forward as fast as you can, 40 seconds backward as fast as you can. And maybe if you have people sitting and in their workplace, and not exercising, you can encourage them just to do this every two, three hours or so. Let them just exercise that little bit. Every little bit helps. And the ABC is to control blood sugar <coughs> when it goes up, blood pressure and cholesterol. And we've spoken about the anti budget injection. And then over back to Claudette to talk a bit about rehabilitation. Thank you so much, Corin. And I must tell the people if I lost timing there, because Corin couldn't see what I'm seeing. So I did try to keep up with the slides. I hope I did it all right. So for you, for you people in the rehabilitation game, what is what do you have to do if somebody at your place of work presents with low vision? Well, the first thing, of course, obviously, is you're going to get an ophthalmologist uh, to give you a diagnosis. And then you can do one of two things. You can look for a low vision optometrist, an occupational therapist, perhaps a mobility instructor. You might look at skills of daily living. Perhaps you can organize audio books for them. You can look at assistive devices for them. You can investigate their diet and their lifestyle. And you can look at smartphone and showing them how to use your smartphone. And instead of all of those, except for the ophthalmologist, you can do independently, or maybe you can just refer your patients to Retina South Africa. And that entire spectrum of rehabilitation, Retina South Africa will coordinate and orchestrate to make sure that the patient's needs are absolutely fulfilled. For example, 
assistive devices, assistive technology, electronic devices and apps are the way of the future with artificial intelligence. Smartphone apps, you can get voice, you can be, get a program called Be My Eyes. Most of these are free and work for free on a smartphone. You can get computer programs, which give you magnification and voice to assist people with emails, with documents and with the internet. You can also get uh, specialized devices that are task specific, you can help students, people in the workplace, in their home. But I must warn you that no one device fits all. So it is a complicated story, and Gail will tell you more about rehabilitation. But referral to low vision optometrist rehabilitations, experts, and specialist supplies is actually what Retina South Africa does so well. And uh, if we want to look at what we actually do, we first of all have to identify patients. We then do, after a needs assessment, we give them information, education, counseling, support and intervention. We then talk to them about assistive devices and all that rehabilitation that we discussed. We facilitate genetic testing because we know the way forward for genetic conditions is actually genetic specific treatments and they are on the way and there's one already available. We collaborate with clinicians and the Division of Human Genetics and international researchers. We do advocacy. We, we bring the clinical trials to South Africa and we have a confidential patient registry. And um, if anybody wants more information, there's a lot of information on our website, which is retinasa.org.za. You can always email us or you can contact Gail and Gail will put you onto the right people if you have a specific condition, uh, question. And please, to do us a favor, please nominate us as a beneficiary at myschool.coza and at no cost to you, we get a small donation which will help us to beat retinal blindness. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and perhaps we can turn it over to Gail to moderate the questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Karen and Claudette for uh, excellent presentation under some extreme uh, circumstances. I think you did a, an extremely good job. And um, so I'm going to ask, are there any questions in the room? And to our listeners out there, um, thank you for joining us. I'm not sure how many joined us, but um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Any comments? Excellent presentation. I have a question. They mentioned um, people over 40 should um, go and see an optician or an ophthalmologist. So I'm just questioning, do opticians actually test for enough or should we all be seeing an ophthalmologist on a regular basis? The, the ophthalmologist will most certainly have a, um, a retinal camera and things like that. But certainly if some of the more advanced optometrists do, I know that at the Low Vision Center in Johannesburg, for example, they certainly have a retinal camera. They can take that photograph of the retina and um, see if there are drusen. And not only that, like also those microaneurysms but uh, I think a good starting place is to say, if you're over 40, you should see an optometrist at least, well, Corin says annually, I say every two years, but in that order, you should be seeing so I, some. I was talking about people with diabetes who yeah. need the annual check. Yes. Yeah. So, but I think anybody needs an annual check, anybody over the age of 40. If, if they've got a bit of a middle-aged spread, then yes, definitely agree with you. Did, so if anybody's sitting there with a middle-aged spread, you, you heard Karen. And even people without a middle-aged spread. I think, you know, when we talk about um, not only um, things like increased pressure, which can lead to glaucoma, um, you know, you should be seeing an, an opt op optometrist. I'm always amazed that people go every year for a, a, for a, to see a dentist. They get their teeth checked very regularly. They never miss. And I know teeth are important, but not even a fraction as important as your vision. And people just don't avoid. They go from year to year without actually having any eye checks. So, yeah, annual eye check is a good idea. Thank you. Can I just answer from a local point of view is that many optometrists in Port Elizabeth have fundus cameras. Yeah. So I think, I think that if you 
of consulting your optometrist if you have one, ask them, do you have a fundus camera? Because that is when they will take the photo of your retina and pick up the yep. Absolutely, that's very important. And you know what's also very interesting is they, there's been a lot of work in the last research, and Karen will comment as well in the last year or two, about that fundus photograph can actually show up many neurological diseases before there's any other sign. Karen, perhaps you will comment, comment on that? Um, the fundus is, um, sorry, the fundal photograph, I was just looking, my electricity has just come on. So <laughs> <It's late. laughs> It came on a bit earlier than predicted. But yes, the the eye, they say, is certainly the gateway to not only the soul, but the gateway to the brain, the gateway to a lot, a huge amount of information. And a good neurologist, a good um, person who specializes in neuro-optometry can pick up a host of diseases based on a retinal photograph. And yes, it is a wonderful source of information. Yeah. And, Excellent warning. And, and as Karen said, you know, she spoke about sugar. Last of all, and people say, oh, I'm fine, my sugar level is, is fine, it's not high. But that's the last thing to go up. But those tiny little spots of bleeding of the microscopic will show up on a fundus pho photograph long before there's any other signs. So yeah, a, a annual eye check with a good fundus photograph is important. And especially if you have that middle age spread. Any more questions? No, not, you can even have a middle age spread when you're a teenager. And we know that those people are in in danger and in a paper that i read not long ago they're picking up cardiovascular damage in primary school children 40 percent of primary school children in the certain area in the united states i can't remember exactly i think it was florida had early signs of cardiovascular damage primary school children with middle age spread <laughs> if they finish all their food or an ice cream if they behave really well. Rather tell them they can have a gentle <laughs> wash if they, eat, if they finish the ice cream. <laughs> it's all a question of perception. Gail, have you got any more people with questions? I don't see anybody here on the chat. Anybody else? Um, I don't know from our Zoom people. Uh, um, there is something on the chat. Okay. Uh, Nolene says... I just want to mention that Dr. Gardner will see IODs for eye injury directly. You can ask them straight. You can take them straight there. Now, interestingly enough, do you know that every specialist needs a referral from a GP or a similar, but not an eye specialist? Did you know that? You can, anybody can actually phone up and make an appointment to see an eye specialist. And if they ask you who referred them, who referred you, you can say, actually, I don't need a referral. <laughs> and that's something that's very little. That actually is not, not known. So, yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, seeing that they've mentioned eye um, trauma, I just want to point out that very often in a factory situation, people get little bits of iron into the eye and we know that if you get iron into the eye it directly damages the retina in exactly the same way that macular degeneration does so you can get a person who's fairly young who's got a, that little sliver of iron into the eye and they can get macular degeneration even within a few months after this injury has happened to them Absolutely. And, I, aware of that. and of course, that little sliver of iron is actually microscopic. It doesn't have to be very big at all. Exactly. Yeah. Any other questions, Gail? I, I don't see anybody on the chat. No, we've got nobody on the chat. 
I think we're almost running out of time, but um, perhaps we'll hand over to you, Gail, and you can handle any other questions because I'm sure our time is up, ladies, I think. Yes. Okay. So once again, thank you, Claudette um, and uh, Karen and your team up there um, for an excellent presentation. And um, I think we'll, we'll sign off and out and then I'll talk to the ladies here in the room. Absolutely. And we really want to apologise for this, what seemed like a very disjointed and, and, and hectic and uh, poorly organised presentation, but of course... ESCOM permitting next time, we will do it in a far slicker and more professional way. Thank you. Well, as, as I told Claudette, Gail, you can also know, I bought an inverter this morning. It's coming early next week. So even if it is a power outage, I will be able to continue. And I'm going to be ordering one, I hope, tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and we thank you for your attention, and we'll hand you over to, into the capable hands of Gail. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much.